today we begin the finals of the Opera Euro Rapid. We've got Magnus Carlsen versus Wesley So, a rematch of the Skilling Open, which was two tournaments ago in the Champions Chess Tour. We have a matchup for third place between Maxim Vashelagrov and Timur Rajabov, and that is the one that we will start with. Timestamps on the video player, I got nothing else to say. Timur and MVL drew their first game, so let's just get that right there on the scoreboard immediately. It is half-half. We will begin with game number two. Timur's got white, he plays knight f3, knight f6, and c4, basically trying to see whether or not MVL will play g6, d5, or c5, because that is what MVL plays. He plays g6 and d... Oh, wow! <laughs> it's amazing, how did I... how did I know? Oh, MVL's playing with black, of course. Takes, takes. Now, Magnus yesterday played h4 against MVL. Timur plays e4, and then rather than taking toward the center, goes like this and trades queens and removes his right to castle. Now, if you're watching as a beginner or an intermediate player, you're like, wait a minute, every chess coach in the history of the internet and before that says not to do this. Right. Anyway, so f6, uh, the point of f6 being that you take away the entrance points, and now we play h4 rather than developing a bishop or getting the king out of the way. Look, you're watching, it's like watching painters paint, right? Like at some point... You know, when it's such fine art, you have no idea what's actually going on. You just pretend to like it because everybody else looks cultured. So h4, h5, and now e5. Timur plays like this because he wants MVL to take and to, to attack the g6 pawn. He also wants to put his bishop on d3 where he will attack this. And actually, after king f7, and now rook e1 bringing the rook to the middle, bishop g4 pinning the knight, and king c2 getting out of the way, this has all been seen before. And if you ask me in this position, why doesn't MVL take, take, and then go here... I'll tell you why. Because when he takes, Timur's gonna throw in an in-between move. Zwitschenzug, it's my best pronunciation. E6 check, and then he's gonna take. And here Black's position is not good. That's why MVL doesn't do that. Instead he plays rook d8. Up until bishop f4, and now this is the first official brand new move of the game. It comes on move for 14. MVL plays king g7. We get bishop e4, adding pressure to the knight on c6. f5, attacking that bishop. And now an explosion. Bishop takes knight. We get pawn takes, knight jumps, takes, and takes. Okay, so what's going on? Material is completely equal. White is a little bit better. Why is white a little bit better? Because this bishop is really bad, and I'm going to play the move f3. You say, well, Levy, I could just play h4. I understand that, uh, but what happens when I move? Well, Levy, I can just play h3. I understand that, but what if I just take? All right, well, now my bishop is free. You're not wrong, but the problem is you've spent all this time doing this. I'm going to push and try to infiltrate with my bishop, or attack this pawn on c7. So MVL, what he does is he just gives away the f-pawn completely. He just takes it, he allows Timur to take it, and what he does is he activates the rook and activates the bishop. In fact, he activates it to such an extent that Timur's king has to run out to the side of the board. But it's actually safe there. That's the thing. It runs out to a4, but it can't actually be attacked. And Timur begins... <laughs> I forgot about that move. Yeah, Timur just just says, I mean, I, like, why not? You know, if the king's got to go do the, you know, some, sometimes the, the head of the mafia has to go do the, you know, the, the dirty work himself, right? So the king is going out to a5, a6, uh, which is kind of a funny move because you say, all right, well, take me. Yeah, but if you take, the rook can go to b8, and now the, the king is kind of paralyzed on the, on the a file. There's always the threat of rook a3, although not right away, because rooks can't teleport through pawns. Welcome to Gotham Chess Recaps, where we learn things every single video. Bishop c5, king e6, and bishop back to e3. Now, here MVL could have repeated, but probably Timur would have done something else. Uh, we got f3. Not too much occurs. I mean, a lot of shuffling. But suddenly, Timur comes up with a cool idea. Rook h4. Because he's basically asking himself, how can I make progress in this position? I put my king in front of everybody else here, so I can't go there. My bishop is nice, but that's it. What about g4? He looks for a pawn break, and he's able to accomplish that by playing rook to h4 and trying to play this move. Well, not just trying, by succeeding, and then the entire king side falls apart. Now Timur has passed pawns. Well, this is a passed pawn. This pawn's got a pawn kind of covering, but... And the king there is open. So we get bishop to, uh, c4, bishop to c4, rook h6, king d7, g6, and the pawn's going. And a few moves later, that pawn is able to make it to g7. And now he's threatening rook h8. So rook f4, and black is hanging on. I mean, black, in, black, black is holding on for dear life, but rook e2. Now we attack the e7 pawn. So black is going to have to defend that, and we take it. Oops. Wasn't actually defended, because takes, takes, that's why. 
Because that has nothing to do with the rook. It has to do with the fact that if I move my rook now, I'm queening. And so when you go, like, MVL played rook f3 looking for... Oop, not, not that, that would be terrible, but looking for a mate, uh, which would have been nice. But check here, and we, we promote with check. And you say, well, why didn't MVL just go rook g4? MVL didn't go rook g4 because of this. Because bishop takes rook, king takes, and rook c8. Very important trick. You want to promote, but you also realize that you're actually happy trading rooks. Because now this is a losing king and pawn endgame. And that's why. So Timur Rajabov of the Wolfpack. The legendary YouTube Wolfpack featuring Anish Giri and Vidit. Converts this position with no problems. Nice game by Timur. Walked the king out to the other side of the board as a deflection. That's what this was. The king on a5 was just like a distraction. And then he was able to infiltrate on the right side of the board. So a big win for him. Timur. One and a half. Now MVL is going to try to strike back. Let's go to game number three in the match. MVL plays e4, Timur plays c5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, opens Sicilian, takes takes, and the immediate move e5. This is known as the Kalashnikov variation. Probably the coolest name in chess. Knight b5, trying to get knight d6, and then if trade queen takes, and this bishop kind of relinquishes dark squared control. And now the knight drops back, and you would say, why would the white knight go on such a journey? Literally, watch its journey. It comes back to c2, because... In the way black plays this opening, black accepts a terrible weakness on d5. That is a structural weakness, a pawn weakness, a weakness that white can infiltrate on. Uh, and white has very good control of the position. Look at white's aesthetic here. Two horses, two pointed hats. Now, Timur plays on the queen side with the move b5. But takes, takes, and now the knight comes to b4. There's a threat to go to a6. And Timur allows it and gives away the b5 pawn. But... He does that because he can create counterplay himself on that queen side to win a pawn on b3. However, it's like it's a constant conversation. In doing that, he allows MVL to have open lines, so his rook is more open. He's still got dominant control of d5, and the a pawn is a pass pawn. Okay? So bishop goes back to f8, rook d1, rook a5, and now MVL finally says, look, man, I've had enough. I mean, it's, it's kind of like having a really fancy piece of furniture in your house that you never use. Well, I'm going to use it now, knight d5. Its value just went down by about 50% because you sat in it. Uh, but, you know, at least it's comfortable. So queen e1. He tries to get this rook out of the way so he can push this pawn. The rook moves. He doesn't push the pawn. In fact, he pushes the pawn on the other side of the board. What a picky guy. To be honest, if you play a5 in this position, you get to move, but after bishop takes d5, I've removed the knight from the defense of these two squares, so let's say rook d5, queen c7, and I'll target this pawn. So I'm almost going to use the pawn that you've pushed just immediately against you, although the game still would have been interesting. Instead, after kicking the rook out, he goes h4, and he also goes h5, and then he also goes h6. So, in the middle of the game, MVL says, everything else I have looks nice, I just need to push my h-pawn all the way down. The reason he actually went queen e1 is because now his queen can make it out this way. Please keep that in mind because it will become important in the future. Knight takes a4. Wait a minute, he lost that pawn. Yeah, but he's getting in on the other side, which is the most important thing. He's getting in on that side of the board. That's why his queen is here. He left this open so that his queen could go to h4 and try to get into d8. And Timur resigned. That's why I told you to keep this move in mind. And you say, what the hell happened in that game? How did it get so bad? Well, when MVL played the move h4, what he realized is that he actually controls with his pieces some very important squares near the enemy king. These three major pieces are on the opposite side of the board. I, I don't know which way it would be, but they're on the opposite side. Which means the king is hanging out with Mr. Pointed Hat over here, but the bishop can't really move anywhere. If it goes here, it gets taken, and it can't eat its own pawn. Welcome to Gotham Chess Recaps, where we learn new things every video. And that is why he played h4, and then played h5, and, I mean, Rajabov probably should have played h6, but he was like, I don't know, this looks stupid. And then it got there, and he was like, oh, this is actually not so stupid after all, never mind. And the game ends. It ends because, well, let's say he plays queen a5, trying to stop this, then I have knight e7 check, and I win your bishop. I win that poor bishop on c8. And... Wait a minute, did that bishop ever move? It did. It moved to e6 and then back to c8. So, very uh, interesting lifespan of the bishop. MVL wins, and now it all comes down to the final game. And you know someone won, because otherwise I would have just told you it was a draw. So, Timur's got the white pieces, MVL's got the black pieces. 
What opening are we going to get? Very good. Very good guess. We are going to get another Grunfeld because at this point, I'm not even fully convinced that man knows how other openings go. I think he just, he like, you know, we need water, we need nutrition, we need, we need food. I think that MVL just every day takes like a capsule with his, vit like his daily vitamins of just Grunfeld knowledge and he just embeds it further and further into his brain. Now the difference is that Knight D7 happens. So, so this is kind of like in uh, 200 games, this is like in about six or 700 games. And the position looks different. It, it really does. Uh, at this point, there's already no more games in the database. Pawn structure is symmetrical. Some wrinkles, some, some differences, but four and three on both sides. So Timur plays King C2, B5. And VL says, you trying to go over there? Good luck. Bishop E3 hits the knight, so the knight has to move. Chess is an easy game. Knight B3, and now Bishop E2, and Knight C5, offering a trade of knights. The knights are traded, Bishop E5. So just like last game, Timur is looking, how can I make progress in this position? Uh, and no, he does not play h4. Uh, not yet anyway, spoiler alert. He plays a4. He's trying to make progress with the flank pawns because he has a small lead in development. His rooks are connected and his bishops are a bit more active. He trades in this case, but now he takes, takes, and he's opened the file for his rook to play rook a7. Uh, he kind of sped past the b5 pawn because, yes, he can play rook a, uh, he can play rook a5, but then maybe there is c6. Maybe there is rook b8. To be honest, there was also a move here like black can immediately go for counterplay. Just say, you could take this, but in taking it, you will relinquish a lot of your advantage of activity. So he plays rook a7. He wants a more active rook, is thinking more long-term, and now takes control of the only open file. And remember a long time ago, I promised you that progress would be made in this position um, on the uh, the h file. Yeah, that, that's coming. For now, he just activates his king. He now takes double wielded control of the queen side. So very cool how he does that. He, he plays a4, then he takes it. They make it look so simple. Then we try to do it, and all of a sudden we're down like 16 bishops. And we're like, how did that happen? Rook a6, rook c7. So a death, deathly fight for that c6 pawn. Bishop d3, and now h4. I told you it was coming. h6, and now f4. You'll remember in yesterday's or two days ago, uh, MVL lost an endgame to, uh, to, to Magnus. Uh, and Magnus basically did this. He just expanded on with his pawns. And that's now what Timur does. So, so he fights back with f5, g3, consolidating the structure, bishop back to d7. Now we go king d4. We go king d4 because we're not really worried about this. In fact, we can just bring our king back. And black can't go back. Pawns can't go backwards. Welcome to Gotham Chess Recaps. Right, so, if, I mean, if we move up, then we get mated. If we had moved up, we would get mated. So, don't get mated. You can go back and make a weakness. And now this transformation leaves a 2-on-3 and a pawn structure imbalance. And Rajabov, after that trade, brought his rook back to try to fight against the king. So we get rook e8 and rook f1. King gets out of the way. But now bishop e4. The king's squares over there are looking limited. Rook e5. And now that move. That is a scary move. h6 and rook f6 is coming. Maxime plays c5. King goes back. And now rook comes back to e6. The problem with the rook coming back to e6 is that bishop d5 is a killer. It's a killer because the rook can't defend against this and rook coming into f7. Now we get rook e7, rook takes pawn, and the base of the operations collapses, and the rest is an avalanche. One check on the other side of the board, that's why you just push your h-pawn. Just push your h-pawn. Just, just push it. I mean, it, look what it becomes the hero. And uh, rook f8, and, and that's it. This was the end of the game. You say, why did he resign? Well... Let's give MVL a move, like check, uh, king d4, and then like rook c8 to try to trade off the rook. You think that's going to make you any progress? It's actually not. Because even after the trade of rooks, I go check with the bishop. The, if the king goes to the back rank, I have rook d8, and that's game over, because either I win your bishop or I checkmate you, depending on where you go. And this is the best thing that black is going to get, down bishop and three pawns versus rook and four. And I think Timur Rajabov would have won this game. It's a hot take, but I think he would have. And he did. He actually won after rook f8. So a very, very bloody affair. Two and a half for Timur. And if I just clear this out, Timur Rajambov now has a 1-0 lead going into tomorrow's matchup. Now we move to the main event of the evening. The gentleman featured on the thumbnail. And we're actually going to kick things off again in the second game. The first game ended in a more or less peaceful draw where actually Magnus slipped up like for half a move. Uh, but we're going to start things off in the second game. So we get e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, and knight f6. And Wesley So clearly has seen the Gotham Chess YouTube video 
win in seven moves the fried liver attack. Because in this position, he played knight g5. And it's actually funny because this is going to be a really fun game because we're going to look at the, the true theory of the position. The deep theory that you don't have to know because your opponents will lose their queen, both rooks, both bishops here. But d5, ed5, and now rather than playing knight d5 and getting checkmated in a few moves, Magnus plays the main line knight a5. We get bishop b5 check, the main move, a trade, and bishop d3. Bishop d3 is not the main move, there's other moves here, but Wesley so likes to play bishop d3. We get knight to d5, which attacks the knight with the queen, the knight comes back, pawn is defended, white castles, black castles, and white plays rook e1 attacking the pawn on e5. And here Magnus Carlsen forgot about that and played the move f5. No, I'm just kidding. f5 is a very trendy move. Black is scoring very well with this move f5. It's a computer move. Black sacrifices the pawn and plays queen f6. And now white comes back. And essentially what black is saying is, look, man, I understand that you're up two pawns, but look at your pieces. This is straight up looking like a five-year-old learned chess like three days ago and is just developing pieces back and forth, right? So black has what's called compensation. But Wesley himself has had this on the board already with white. It's in the database against Nodirbek Abdusaturov, the super talent 15-year-old uh, from Uzbekistan. And in that game, black played g5 attacking, and now white plays c4. c4 is a very unique move, played only a few times. In fact, I believe there's another game in the data database between Levan Ranyan and uh, Vidit Gujarati. So c4, knight f4, bishop back to f1. Wesley so has had all of this in his game already, including the sacrifice. Isn't that insane? This looks like both players are making stuff up. This has happened before at the GM level. This is how theory works. Now, finally, Wesley plays a surprise. He had a game, in that game against Nodirbek, he played this move. In this game, he plays queen c3, still following a game between two Polish grandmasters played on January 2nd, 2021 in uh, Krakow, in Poland. So knight b7, and now officially we have a new position. So Wesley is kind of expanding. We get a5 and b5. Queen takes d4 now. Maybe Wesley forgot his preparation because the best move in this position for white is bishop c4. I'm sure Wesley has this in his notes. But the point after bishop c4 is that queen c3, knight c3, and black is just going to have to defend this knight. But white is going to stockpile pressure. Look at these laser beam bishops just egg shish kebabbing, right? So Wesley, no pun intended, plays like this, but Magnus is able to sacrifice back the material and stabilize the position. So now Magnus has no problems. In fact, Magnus is better because he's one move ahead of white. White needs one more move to hold everything together, and he doesn't have it. Everything is weak a little bit. Bishop e3, now bishop e5 is attacking. Now bishop takes c5, takes. Wesley decides to just beeline for an endgame. It's like when a fighter is hurt in a fight from a punch. So you're a wrestler now, in the words of Nate Diaz, right? They try to take you down to stall you out. The problem is... Magnus is ready. Rook bishop four versus rook bishop four. What is important in endgames? Being up material. Magnus doesn't have that. Activity and where you can create play and the two on one here with the rook coming in, this is a problem. This is a problem. White is not active. So Magnus uses the activity to create problems for Wesley. Wesley plays g3 and rook c2 trying to stabilize, but Magnus has broken through. And now this is just, uh, this is just a, 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 a fight like to survive king f7 bishop d2 magnus does not trade hey you, you want to take on d2 what are you what are you, are you out of your, you're out of your goddamn mind don't take this that's the bit this bishop hasn't moved past the middle line the entire game don't trade you need to keep the pieces on the board unless you do it for a reason you damage the structure i did that for comedic effect don't trade unless there's a legitimate reason to do so White is now killing his structure. So now you can do it. Rook b7, that's a difference. And now rook a7. The rook defends the pawn from the back, and the king will try to come in diagonally. Now, if this was a bishop, you would just take the rook. Welcome to the recaps where we pretend kings are bishops. And now let's watch it all unfold. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going the wrong way. Magnus. Ma there you go, buddy. Magnet. Magnus, you're going the wrong way. All right, come on. Come on, Magnus. Come on, Magnus. There we go. He did it. He, I told you he was... Wait, Magnus, wrong way. Well, Magnus uses the pawn as a perpetual decoy. Notice he didn't just push it. 
He left it on A3 the rest of the game. He uses the pawn as a decoy to immobilize White's movement away because it would promote, and he uses the infiltration to get in this way. Couple of things at play there. Activity, traded the 2-on-1 down to an endgame, passed pawn, kept it there with the rook behind it, and then walked his king in by using that pawn as a deflection and uh, damaging the structure so he was able to infiltrate. He made it look easy. Magnus Carlsen is up one and a half, half. And they drew the next game very quickly. So now we go to game number four. Wesley So, I apologize. Wesley So has the white pieces again, and he must win to, to tie the match. Uh, if, he, if he draws or he loses, then Magnus takes a one nothing lead. Uh, going into tomorrow's set. So again, we get this, and now Magnus... <laughs> Magnus does not play Knight F6. Magnus doesn't want to tr face the fried liver again. Even though he got a good position, Wesley might come with a surprise and, and kind of get a better uh, situation in this game. So we get C3, Knight F6, and now, rather than D3, the Giocopiano, we get the opening of the center. This is very rare at this level. E5, D5, it's all theory. Bishop b5, you go, why, why isn't that taken? Well, because that, that rook is never going to get taken. Actually, black on d5 is going to have a very good position. In fact, in a lot of these king's pawn positions where white plays d4 and black takes and white pushes, if there is a bishop on c4, the move d5 is extremely important. Keep it. That is an extremely useful piece of information. So knight e4 takes on d4, bishop goes back to b6, white develops, black castles, white develops, Black goes here, h3, bishop h5. And now white plays the move queen c2 in a lot of these positions, including right now. Now black plays bishop g6, defending the knight and lining up an attack on the queen. So the queen moves out of the way again. You say, why didn't the queen just go there in the first place? Because the bishop was here. The bishop would have taken the knight, damaging white's pawn structure. And by making the bishop move away, queen c2, queen b3. When we do it, it's called stop wasting time and castle. And when they do it, it's <laughs> it's such interesting opening theory. I don't know why I put on that accent, but I just assume that like, you know, the French are like more posh, more luxurious. Knight e7, castles, c6, bishop d3. All seen hundreds of times so far, even on the 15th move. Now we get knight f5 attacking the bishop. Wesley comes back to c2. And Magnus officially makes it a new position by taking on c3. Up until this point, three games in the database went take, take, knight g3. So Magnus trades and trades and trades, and now plays the move f6 to try to trade again. So what is going on? In a position like this, both sides, you got to look at material, completely equal. What is the imbalance? One guy has a bishop, the other guy has a horse, and the pawn structure is super weird. I don't know what the heck is going on here. Position is more or less closed with some small openings. And since you have a knight, you are going to be able to fight on the light squares. This bishop cannot fight on the light squares. Pawn breaks, where are they? Oh, I see one, c4. We get bishop c7, and now we get take, 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 take. And the expansion in the center with e4. Queen goes back to d7. So now what? Rook d1, bring in the rook, you might as well, the rook's not playing. And now what? Now's the question, now what? How does white make progress in this position? I'm asking you. Yeah, it's a pop quiz. How does white make progress? You gotta look around at all your pieces. At this point, pawn breaks aren't really gonna do the job because if you just do this, yes, you've broken with the pawns, but black just blocks your pawns. Now what? And now you've got this to worry about on h2, queen c5, bishop b6. White is still a little bit better here, but d5 is one option. This horse. Look around in the position. You can have anything. Knight h4. And knight f5, that's what you're looking for. And now Magnus doesn't like that, so he goes here. Wesley just pushes. That is not a free pawn. That would lose you a rook. I would take your queen and then take your rook. Don't lose a rook. d5, bishop e5, and rook b1. b6, queen c4, rook e8. Good block, good, very nice position. But again, what's next? We're, like, can we push? Can we go here and push to infiltrate? Can we try to play g4, h4, g5? What's next? Okay, king h1, I think I know where we're going now. Okay, okay, I like that. Yes, sir, I like that. Rook f4, rook takes e4. Wait, what? I could just take. Ah, Magnus is sacrificing. He doesn't like this bind on his position, and now we get rook e1. Rook d5, material completely equal, but, but, there was a move here that kills the position. I want you to find a move here that threatens maiden 1. 
not so easy to do. Play a move that threatens that if it was your move again, you would have mate. It's not so easy. Rook g4. You cut the king off and no one covers the back rank, so rook e8 mate. So Magnus plays h5. Check. Here. Check again. Here. But why would he just go up? Nobody can check the king. Or can they? Look at that. That is the power of a queen. Queen c1 and it's over. So Magnus goes back to h8. But whoever said we can't play queen c1 in this position? Wesley So plays queen c1. And that is unstoppable. And Magnus Carlsen resigns. Crazy. And Wesley So ties the match at 2-2. Two to two, And now it's half, half. So the winner of tomorrow's rapid portion wins the tournament. Or the winner of tomorrow's blitz or the winner of tomorrow's Armageddon. And we say, how did that go so wrong for Magnus Carlsen so quickly? Well, to be honest, the position was really difficult. This sacrifice was really, it was really like already kind of a desperate last resort. But rook d5 was the blunder. Rook d5 with rook g4 and queen c1. Beautiful coordination of Wesley's pieces. Here, there's only one move according to the machine that doesn't lose, and it's just basically not letting the rooks in. But still, Wesley can play rook d1, and in the long run, push this pawn through and win the endgame. So a beautiful game from Wesley. He's showing some tremendous preparation. I wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow we don't see e4, e5 anymore, or we see something completely different in e4, e5 positions. But today, Magnus Carlsen did not get his revenge. He will have to seek redemption tomorrow.